Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Opportunities for Using PacBio Pac Long Read Sequencing for COVID-19 Research. This webinar is part of the ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Pacific Biosciences. For more information about our sponsor, please visit PacBio.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Meredith Ashby. Dr. Ashby is the Director of Market Strategy for Microbial and Cancer Genomics at Pacific Biosciences. For a complete biography on Dr. Ashby, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Ashby. You may now begin your presentation. Hi, my name is uh, Meredith Ashby, and I'm the Director of Market Strategy at Pacific Biosciences, focusing on our microbiology um, applications. Uh, so um, many of us in the scientific community are uh, looking for ways that we can contribute to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and the same is true for all of us at PacBio. So I was very happy to be invited to speak to you today about how our technology might be useful to you uh, as you plan uh, your own research efforts. So I wanna preface my talk by saying that all of the applications uh, that I present here are intended for research use only, and they're not intended for use in diagnostic procedures. So jumping right into it, uh, how, how is PAC biosequencing uh, potentially helpful uh, in your COVID-19 research? Uh, so uh, to begin, I wanna, I wanna start out by describing uh, some of the unique qualities of PacBio Hi-Fi reads, um, and then go into more details about how those qualities uh, will be useful in different types of applications, including SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing, and then also uh, understanding the host response uh, to, to infection. And some of the uh, topics that I'll discuss are um, BCL, BCR receptor sequencing, also IGH locus sequencing, and finally HLA sequencing. So to start at the beginning, uh, PacBio uh, is unique in that we are able to produce not only long reads, but really long reads that have very high accuracy. And this is uh, quite well differentiated from the other sequencing options that you have available to you. Uh, so how are we able to do that? So in the figure on the right, you'll see uh, our smart bell, which is a template molecule for sequencing. And the nature of this smart bell is such that when it opens up, we can sequence multiple times all around the smart bell over and over again. And so even though individual subreads may have errors, those, sub, those errors are completely random in nature. And by generating a consensus accuracy uh, from that one single molecule, we can generate high phi reads. So these high phi reads uh, have very high accuracy. In our amplicon sequencing and targeted sequencing application, Hi-Fi reads can be as long as uh, 15,000 base pairs in length, and they are over 99% accuracy. Uh, and so this combination is, is very interesting because um, the combination of high accuracy with long read lengths allows you to, to phase variance and also resolve uh, repeat regions, and to do that in such a way that any variance you detect, you know, are real and not just sequencing errors. So my first application that I want to talk about is SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. So how can HiFi sequencing help us to understand the biology of, of this virus? Uh, so there's a few things that you might want to do, uh, use long read sequencing for. Uh, the main, um, main applications fall under mutation phasing and rare variant detection. Um, so these types of questions are really important uh, to uh, researchers who may be looking to understand the epidemiology of the pandemic, 
or to um, develop vaccines or even therapeutics. Uh, so in order to determine where the virus genome is stable uh, and therefore susceptible to attack, um, you really need to have uh, information about variants that's very highly accurate along the full length of the genome. And some applications might include determining, uh, you know, what part of the, the virus antibodies are binding to successfully in a successful immune response, um, and also for evaluating vaccine effectiveness. Um, in addition, uh, long read sequencing can be very useful to determining uh, the virus population structure. So, for example, uh, long read sequencing will allow you to monitor uh, the evolution of the virus either within a person over the course of infection or between different uh, regions uh, or over time as the epidemic proceeds. And keeping an eye on this evolution can be very important for example, making sure that testing uh, remains accurate, that the virus does not evolve in such a way that the test quality is compromised. And in the event that uh, we finally do develop therapeutics uh, for COVID-19, it'll be important in tracking the possibility of drug resistance um, emergence. And then finally, it can be very useful uh, in tracing and determining um, how people in new communities, whether they're becoming uh, infected as, as new carriers uh, move into the area or whether uh, continued outbreak is happening from silent carriers uh, within the community that are all closely related. And so then one final application would be as quality control and vaccine manufacturing. Uh, a lot of vaccines involve live attenuated virus and one obviously would want to make sure that the vaccine being produced is the same as the one um, that was developed and that the virus is not mutating back to a more virulent form during the course of production. So uh, you may say that there's already uh, very accurate information being uh, produced about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so I want to uh, just draw your attention to the data that's currently available in GIS, GISAID, which is the Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. Uh, so at PacBio, we uh, downloaded all approximately 3,000 sequences that were uh, present as of March 31st. And this data contains assemblies from all possible technologies. And I do want to um, highlight that currently there's only two PacBio sequences that are available there. So the information that I'm showing you about PacBio data is certainly not um, exhaustive or definitive, but it is suggestive. Uh, so, the first thing I want to point out is that many of the genome assemblies in GSAID are actually quite low quality. So, if you look at this graph, this graph is an assessment of how many segments of the viral genome there are that are separated by ends. And so, what you'll see is that even with Illumina sequencing, about 40% of those assemblies have gaps of ends in them. And then, if you look at the ONT uh, assemblies that have been posted, about half of those assemblies have gaps as well. And so if you have gaps in this sequence, and that means that there's regions of the virus where you really don't know what's happening, if there are SNPs forming, if there are mutations forming. And with this level of gaps, it's, it's really quite impossible to construct uh, detailed phylogenies in order to look at how the virus is evolving over time in between regions. Here's another way uh, to look at that same uh, quality value. So in this case, we've counted the number of ends in each of these sequences. And you can see that not only are there many gaps, but some of these gaps are, are very long. So, for example, in light green here, these are gaps that are over 100 ends in length. So there's actually quite a lot of missing information for most of these genomes that have been submitted um, before now. In contrast, you'll see that the two packed biogenomes that have been submitted have no ends or gaps at all. They're continuous, and they cover the entire viral region. Um, if you align a lot of the sequences here, either from ONT or Illumina, this is just a representative subset, what you'll also see is that there are problematic regions uh, where there are consistently gaps uh, in all of these different assemblies. And one reason that we think that might be happening is that if you are constrained by using short amplicons, that means you have a lot less flexibility in where you have to park the primers. And those primer locations may not be optimal, and that may be uh, resulting in poor sequence quality in some regions. Uh, 
Uh, so why is it important to have very accurate information? So having higher quality data makes it easier to identify the variable positions in the SARS-CoV genome. And as I mentioned before, uh, the locations of those variable positions are really important uh, for a number uh, for getting at a lot of uh, research type questions. So in the top graph, this is um, a, a graph showing uh, hotspots uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 genome um, before any fil quality filtering is applied to the data sets. Right? And then if you look in the lower graph, this is what that uh, same metric looks like after quality data filtering. And you'll see uh, first of all, that there are hotspots that pop up in the fil quality filter regions that do not appear significant in the pre-quality filtering. And, and so um, this is the, what I mean by saying when you have long and highly accurate uh, sequence data, this is what is going to enable you to tell the difference between sequencing error and variants that are, that are real. So um, it, there are already a number of approaches that are, have been published by um, other researchers that are compatible with using PacBio protocols for sequencing. So one protocol that a lot of people are using right now is the Arctic Network um, primers. And uh, so this is a 98 uh, primer uh, pair protocol that produces relatively short amplicons. And these are absolutely can be uh, sequence on the PacBio as is with whatever barcoding strategy you're already using, and that can be done at very high multiplex levels. Um, however, there's also uh, two different protocols that are available now that uh, employ uh, average amplicon size of around 1,000 base pair amplicons. One is from the CDC, and another is from a publication by Julian Hiscox at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and you can look at our website, www.pacd.com slash COVID-19, uh, to download um, those protocols, um, which are going to have been developed by other people. Uh, and then finally, uh, we at PacBio uh, are in the lab and developing a longer amplicon strategy. So we appreciate that a lot of the uh, patient samples right now are highly fragmented, and that that makes it challenging to amplify amplicons that are longer. However, a lot of the uh, research um, questions that um, uh, want to, that are we're going to have to um, begin addressing as the crisis evolves um, are going to require longer amplicon approaches, and we feel that um, oftentimes uh, researchers will have access uh, to um, viral culture uh, methods in order to produce more intact uh, virion from patient samples. And that these will be a really useful research tool uh, for doing better phasing and phylogeny uh, studies uh, of, of the virus. And then finally, I mentioned that um, amplicons can be multiplexed very highly on uh, the PacBio instruments. And I just wanted to cite one example of this. Uh, we have a customer, Paul Hebert, at University of Guelph, who is doing large scale amplicon sequencing um, in order. Uh, to catalog all of the forms of life that are present uh, on the planet uh, today. And in order to do that, uh, obviously, uh, he has to sequence a lot of amplicons because there's a tremendous diversity. And he has developed a strategy to barcode and pool up to 10,000 amplicons in a single smart cell. Uh, and so there's no question that you can sequence a large number of samples very efficiently and, in fact, very cost-effectively, uh, more cost-effectively than Sanger and um, also more cost-effectively than NGS in some cases. Uh, so a lot of virus researchers have already been using PacBio uh, for the reasons I stated, the ability to sequence complete genomes and to phase SNPs and to do quasi-species determinations. And again, if you look on our COVID-19 website, you'll be able to see a bunch of publications uh, to that effect. Um, and I wanted to just briefly, uh, very briefly, talk about uh, two of those to give you a sense of what's possible with PacBio. So this is an article on altered single molecule real-time sequencing of the HIV end protein. Uh, and so in this recent publication, um, the authors uh, took uh, multiple samples uh, from an autopsy of an HIV positive patient uh, from all of these different tissue types. And then they did uh, full length envelope sequencing of these and then built a phylogeny showing how all of the different virus quasi species uh, were uh, related to each other from different tissues. And very interestingly, they found 
that there's actually a strong compartmentalization of HIV N sequences in the brain versus in the rest of the body. And that this, in fact, had um, very uh, important biological significance because the two different uh, compartmentalized uh, strains uh, were using different receptors in order to gain entrance uh, to, to cells. But um, for our point, for our purposes, I think the larger point here is that these authors found that um, you know, since accurate reconstruction is critical to do any kinds of phylogeny, they chose to do smart sequencing, and that this is what allowed them to get an in-depth uh, analysis uh, to see this level of strain diversification within just a single patient. And then finally, in the paper, uh, they note that the important characteristic of PAC biosequencing is that it can potentially identify all the diversity in each tissue. And again, that's only possible because of the combination of high accuracy and long read lengths. And then I wanted to highlight a second article very briefly. This is uh, another recent article on single cell virus sequencing of the influenza um, uh, infection. So this is a, a paper uh, where the authors applied ISOSeq data, which is our version of RNA-seq, uh, in order to sequence both full-length influenza and also immune response transcripts uh, from single cells. And this HiFi data was able to give them a comprehensive view of the entire influenza mutational landscape in each cell. So if you look onto the right, this is just a subset of a very large figure from the paper where they catalog in every one of the 150 cells that they sorted and sequenced, every type of mutation that is present in each of the different uh, genes present in influenza. And so you'll see high fi sequencing was able to capture both point mutations uh, in the, the red closed and open circles, and then also deletions, which you can see in this figure as yellow bars. Uh, they were even able to detect instances where two slightly different viral variants were present in the same cell. Um, and then fascinatingly, in the 150 infected cells, only 49 of those cells were still wild type 10 hours after infection. Um, so of course we understand that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, does not mutate quite so rapidly, uh, but this is an extreme example of the level of detail uh, that you can get using PAC bio data. And then the authors noted that, you know, there. Their study provides the first complete picture of how viral mutations can affect the course of infection at a single cell level. So another area that PAC biosequencing might be useful to you as you plan your COVID-19 research is in getting at the host response to infection. So um, the host response uh, kind of encompasses uh, a couple different things. One is, of course, the um, B cell uh, development and the uh, immune repertoire that emerges as a result of, uh, of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And some reasons that you might want to look at this include, um, you know, finding broadly utilizing antibodies in recovered patients to use as interim treatments ahead of the development of a vaccine. Uh, we also, uh, there's a lot of interest in understanding why some patients get very sick and others do not. Uh, and one aspect of this might be uh, differences in, uh, in the immune responses. And then a final application would be vaccine response testing, making sure that people are mounting a sufficient response to the vaccine that is going to be protective. A second area will be with uh, trying to delve into the, the germline sequences to understand how allelic differences from person to person might influence uh, disease susceptibility or disease progression. Uh, so a lot of the regions of the genome that are involved uh, in the immune response are highly polymorphic and in the past have been quite challenging to sequence and to phase. And so I want to talk briefly about two examples. One is the IGH locus from which B cell development um, arises and then also HLA sequencing. Um, so um, I'm sure you all remember this quite well uh, from your college introductory biology classes and immunology classes, uh, but I want to briefly recap this because it, it helps to get to the point of uh, emphasizing why TechBio can be useful in studying uh, B-cell receptor diversity. So how does B-cell receptor diversity arise? So it arises in, um, it comes from primarily three different sources. The one is the IGH locus contains a large 
diversity of different V, D, and J alleles. And then these are combined in order to produce uh, antibodies. And you see in this graphic at the top, that CDR3 region, uh, precisely where the V, D, and J regions come together, uh, is the primary point of contact uh, between an antibody and the antigen. Uh, but that's only one source. Further diversity is added because when those VDJ regions are spliced together, uh, it's done in a sloppy manner with uh, random N bases being added uh, between uh, the different combining regions. But there's one more source of diversity, and that is somatic hypermutation. So after B cells are activated, um, they undergo this process by which additional mutations are acquired as the B cells uh, divide and mutate very rapidly in the germinal center. And as a result of that, there are additional completely random mutations that can be introduced anywhere along um, the variable region and not just in that CDR3 region. And the reason this is uh, significant is because most short read strategies uh, only sequence of the CDR3 region because of the limitations on read length. However, with PacBio, you can sequence the entire full length of the B-cell receptor, which allows you to capture um, all of the mutations uh, that arise, both during DDJ recombination and also during somatic hypermutation, while additionally capturing isotype information uh, by sequencing the constant domain. And then the best uh, part at all is that since no assembly is required to do this, we're able to sequence it in one read. The base accuracy is very high and it's consistent across the entire BCR sequence. Whereas with short read strategies, um, assembly is required and it's quite well known that there's a region in the center uh, where those reads are put together that uh, can have lower accuracy. And in addition, these cell receptors that are longer than average may not be able to be assembled at all, and so those would be missing. And that's significant because oftentimes uh, the most effective antibodies are ones that have undergone multiple rounds of activation, and those tend to be longer uh, than average. So if you are interested in doing full-length uh, BCR sequencing with PacBio, there is already a publication that has a detailed protocol for doing this. And you can look up the artisan PCR method, uh, which is published by uh, Marvin Koenig uh, and his collaborators. Um, so the general outline is looks very familiar to you is that you prime from the constant domain and then you use a template switch uh, mechanism in order to sequence the entire uh, receptor. So in most short read protocols, you would then do a nested protocol and sequence only uh, the CDR3 domain. But with PacBio, the nesting priming uh, for the PCR reaction also happens within the, within the constant domain, and so you capture the entirety of that sequence. Uh, so in um, the Artisan PCR paper, one of the key points is that uh, not, not only is it uh, helpful to, gen to capture all the mutations, but um, some pitfalls of using uh, the commonly used multiplex PCR method with short reads were, were highlighted. So this is just one graph from that paper showing uh, that when um, they attempted to sequence the B cell receptor from a large number of different uh, cell lines, including uh, some cancerous cell lines, what they found is that uh, fairly often the multiplex PCR failed to amplify those uh, receptors. And so in cataloging the causes of that, uh, the main cause was mismatches in the primer binding sites. So uh, with cancer, obviously you can get very unpredictable mutations in the BDJ regions, which makes it difficult for multiplex primers uh, to bind to those. But um, it's also very well known uh, that the full diversity of the V, D, and J segments have not been adequately documented and particularly not in equally well documented in all of the different ethnic groups um, that are being impacted uh, by SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that means uh, that um, alleles uh, that are not known may or may not be able to be picked up by the current multiplex primers. And so there's a high risk of missing things that you don't know about when you rely on this multiplex PCR reaction. Um, another uh, issue that can arise is truncation of genes in the sample. And um, 
And again, that falls into uh, uh, the category of the more mutated the B cell receptor is, the more challenging it is to be picked up with this multiplex PCR reaction. And in this graph here, you can see as you move from left to right, um, the researchers plotted the amount of homology between the germline and the sequenced receptor. And they found that uh, the more that that B cell receptor has diverged from the germline, the more likely it is to have dropout in the multiplex PCR reaction. And again, it's known from studies of HIV and, and other types of viral infection that the most effective uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies tend to be the ones that have developed through multiple rounds of affinity maturation and tend to be the furthest from the original germline sequence. Um, and so in, in conclusion, this method is, um, is very advantageous in that it lets you have unbiased comprehensive analysis of the entire uh, B cell receptor repertoire uh, in either healthy or uh, reactive conditions or even in cancer. So one final area I wanted to talk to you about is um, sequencing highly polymorphic regions uh, of the genome that are involved in the immune response. So this is a really interesting article that was um, published uh, by Corey Watson and his collaborators looking at germline sequence uh, of the IGH locus. So in the top, in the top uh, graphic, you'll see the finely mapped sequence of the IGH locus in, two, uh, in one cell line, uh, CH17, uh, which is actually a haploid cell line, and then also in uh, the human reference genome. And so um, these two cell lines, are re these two examples are unique in that CHM17 had a back library which could be used to do Sanger sequencing in order to get this level of resolution. And of course, the human reference genome uh, has been worked on continuously by, for you know, over a decade now in order to incorporate um, as much detail as possible, including in very difficult to sequence regions. Uh, so in the past, getting this level of information was very difficult and quite expensive. However, in this paper, uh, what Watson and colleagues showed is that if they were able to look at um, PacBio reference genomes that had been published and to pull down uh, those sequences um, and to compare them to the high quality references that were available through more time-consuming um, and expensive methods. And the uh, exciting thing is that in all of these PAC bioreference genomes, the IGH domain was fully assembled. And so they were able to do comparative genomics showing that there was a tremendous amount of structural variation, even in just this snapshot of a very small number of reference genomes that they were able to draw from. So excitingly, uh, there was a, um, there's going to be a follow-up paper to this very soon, wherein Corey Watson has developed a target capture method that's going to allow um, this to scale up uh, to, uh, to get this type of detailed IGH locus information from many, many people. Uh, and in fact, the new software tool uh, that has been developed for that purpose has already been uh, published and you could read that um, um, yourself and, and look forward to uh, Corey's next publication, which should be out very soon. And so this is one example of the type of work that it might be interesting to do in order to start to correlate allelic differences uh, between patients and differences in disease uh, severity or outcomes. And one last area uh, where PECBio has been used uh, to look at um, allelic diversity in the immune system is HLA sequencing. So because of, the, again, the combination of long read length and high accuracy, we are able to sequence the HLL genes in their full length. And that means that uh, within one person, the two different alleles that are present assort very clearly. Um, and, um, and so this information uh, is, becomes easily accessible. Um, this is also uh, very, has been very impactful from our customers that are doing this in terms of providing direct evidence for new alleles that were not previously known. Um, and in addition, it's, it's very com, um, cost effective as it uh, can be multiplexed at a very high level. Uh, and so why is it important to have uh, the complete sequence of HLA instead of just the short amplicons that are typically um, used uh, with, a, with an Illumina approach? So the, the reason is that 
variants that are, occur anywhere within the HLA genes, including in the introns, can be biologically meaningful and impactful. So this is um, data from uh, a study, it was a retrospective study of about 900 stem cell transplant recipient pairs. And what they did is they reevaluated the quality of past matches by applying PacBio full-length HLA sequencing uh, to matches that were previously done using short read technology. And this was done at the Anthony Nolan Research Institute. Uh, so what they found is that when you have 100% matching along the full length of all the HLA genes, that significantly improves uh, transplant survival. So if you look on the left, uh, the survival curve uh, on the top, 54.8%, is the survival of patients that had a complete match between the donor and the recipient. And then the dotted line below uh, are instances where they found that upon higher quality sequencing, that there were actually mismatches hiding in regions of the HLA genes that were not previously sequenced. And what they found uh, is that that's very impactful. And the survival rate is um, you know, nearly 20% less uh, with patients that have even that small level of mismatch. And of course, on the right, it's quite well known that when you have near matches, um, even using the old technology approach, for example, less than 11 out of 12 HLA match, um, this already was quite impactful uh, to survival. And it's really the part on the left uh, that was surprising. Um, and having this new level of resolution um, has obviously uh, been very impact impactful for uh, folks that have to undergo stem cell transplant, but it also opens uh, the window to start to look at how differences in these genes uh, may impact the immune response in other types of contexts and not just uh, stem cell transplant. So if you're interested in doing HLA sequencing, uh, we have several service providers that you can contact, Anthony Nolan being one, but also Histogenetics and, and LabCorp as well. So I wanted to end uh, just by saying that um, PecBio is, is ready to support your COVID-19 research. Uh, even though we're in California and the vast majority of us are under the shelter in place order as you yourself might be, um, our shipping department uh, is um, still managing to, to staff uh, the building and we are sending out reagents and fulfilling all of your orders um, so that we can support you all. Um, and then finally, if you want to have more information on any of these protocols um, or read more about any of the articles that I discussed, you can find links to all of that at pacb.com slash COVID slash 19. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ashby, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Dr. Ashby, our first question. Are there timelines for the two to six KB Amplicon protocol? Uh, yes, so that work is ongoing in our R&D uh, department, and we are hopeful to have uh, a protocol that at least works on control samples by mid-next week. Uh, the moment, uh, and once we have those, we'll be sending them out to our collaborators who have the capability to work with patient samples in order to sequence those and, and see how well they do uh, with virus samples that may be more degraded. Uh, but I think in the meantime, uh, it's a great chance to get started with the 1KB Amplicons that are on our website. The feedback we've gotten from customers uh, who are using that protocol already is that even at 1KB, there are a number of patient samples that don't amplify because of the degraded nature uh, of the samples. Um, and then if you, the moment that we have the longer Amplicon protocols, we will post those to our COVID-19 resource page. So you can always check there. Very good, thank you. And where can I get PacBio sequencing done in these times? Yeah, so obviously there's uh, a lot of flux in terms of what sequencing sites are open and which are closed and um, you know, their availability to, to do sequencing. So the best thing to do is that if you have a project that you need sequenced, is to email support at pacb.com or you could also go to our 
COVID-19 resource page and scroll down to the bottom and there's a, you know, ask a scientist button. And then we can put you directly in contact with a service provider who is still open in your area. Very good, thank you. And do you provide technical support? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you don't even have to be a direct customer uh, of TechBio to get support from us. Uh, even if you're a customer of a sequencing core, you can always email um, support at PACB.com or go to our website to get in touch uh, with our, our support team. And we're very happy to help you plan your projects um, or to work through even the technical details that you want to do your own library prep. Um, very good, thank you. Now, Dr. Ashby, this next question is two parts. Is the library prep and data analysis complicated? And is it possible to automate either or both? Yeah, so the great thing is uh, that it, it's actually quite simple. So for the library prep, um, since PAC bio sequencing is so very accurate, you can, if you, you can actually use whatever amplicons that you would already generate for um, you know, shorter Amplicon protocols that you might want to run on a, a short read platform, and you can run those on the TAC bio. Um, so, uh, and any service provider uh, would be able to do the li that library prep for you that last step. Um, and again, if you did want uh, support with that, you can always email us. And in terms of data analysis, again, since uh, the PAC bio data is so highly accurate, uh, you can actually take our data uh, as it comes off uh, uh, the machine as HiFi reads. And you can use whatever pipeline that you would normally use uh, for your short read data to, to do analysis. One of the tools that our virus uh, customers uh, like to use a lot is Genius. We also have a tool called Juliet that helps do minor variant detection. Um, so it's very easy. And if you have more specific questions, we're very happy to uh, um, get online with you and answer those. Very good, thank you. Our next question. Why is having the IGH IOCUS, um, IGUS sequence important? Isn't having the VDJ alleles enough? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think for a long time, people did think that just having uh, the VDJ alleles that are present in a given person was enough to explain differences in the mute response, among other folks. But uh, the work that Corey Watson has been doing uh, initially in mice and now follow-on studies in humans shows that it's not just whether you have a VDJ allele or not, it's also really important uh, what the genetic context is uh, because oftentimes a VD or J allele can be present, um, but it doesn't show up very well in the immune rep repertoire or it shows up in different, at different rates depending on um, SNPs or structural rearrangements in the IGH locus. Uh, so it's really important to have um, not just the VDJ genes, but also the IGH locus to understand uh, the expression levels and the accessibility of the VDJ segments. Thank you. Now, early data seems to indicate that SARS-CoV-2 doesn't mutate as quickly as influenza. Do you think long-read sequencing will still be important for variant detection? That's a really great point, and it's true. It, do, it does seem like SARS-CoV-2 um, doesn't mutate as rapidly as some, which is really great news, obviously, for uh, vaccine development. That said, there are already several reports of deletions in the spike protein and indels elsewhere uh, in the other open reading frames uh, that could be significant. And I would not be surprised that uh, as the pandemic continues, and particularly if therapeutics are developed, um, that as the virus comes under more selective pressure, that we might start to see uh, adaptation um, or other strains um, start to, to mutate out. Thank you. Now we have time for just a few more questions, but I want to let our audience know that those questions we are unable to answer today and those that are submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And let's see. Um, Let's go with uh, this final question. Are you looking to partner with companies to co-market approaches for COVID-19, such as with a company specialized in bioinformatics that can help with data analysis for COVID-19? Uh, we are always uh, happy to work with third-party uh, companies, uh, both for sample prep work or um, for data analysis. And so I think the best way um, 
to do that would be uh, to have our lab roots organizers connect you with me, or you can also just go to the support at techb.com and that will find its way to me or the appropriate person. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Ashby. And we thank mm -hmm. you for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Again, those questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Now, this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of this year, 2020, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.